Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you would like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can mouse over or tap on the video playback area of your screen, and you will see the chapter links written across the bottom, which will allow you to jump right to that specific point in the video. Or you can use the timestamp links down in the video description. So today I have tidbits. I have the results of the informal survey I did asking you about why you may or may not avoid swatching. Um, I answer a question about my knitting style that comes up every so often. Then I want to talk about some yarns I've been playing with in the past week or so and talk a little bit about what the difference is between woolen spun and worsted spun yarns. So let's get started. This week's tidbits are really related to the Knitting History Forum that was this past Saturday, November 7th. Um, it was the first virtual version of this particular conference and it was free to everyone. I mentioned it a couple of times on my channel a few weeks ago when registration for the conference was open and then I was able to attend this conference last Saturday. So when I wanna talk about some of the things that went on in the conference and provide you with uh, more information about how you can learn more about the, the topics that were discussed. So the Knitting History Forum is a group of people around the world who are interested in knitting history. Many of the people are academics, but it, but not all of them are. Um, so it, it would include people like me who's just interested in knitting history and interested in learning more and finding other people with that similar interest as well. So they have a website, and I'll leave a link down below, and they have this online email group, this discussion forum that you can participate in, that you can join, uh, and it doesn't cost anything. If you want to be a member of the Knitting History Forum, there's a 25 pounds uh, uh, sterling that it costs for membership. And that membership would allow you free entrance into the conference when it's an in-person event and allows you some other perks as well, which they let you know on their website. But you can join the email uh, group with, without being a member of the forum itself, without being a paying member. I was pretty new to the whole Knitting History Forum. I really didn't, hadn't even heard of it until I heard about this conference uh, it, itself. And when I looked at, at what the agenda was, I was a little bit nervous about even showing up. Like, did I even belong here? Because I thought at first it was really for people with an academic interest in knitting history, people who were professors. Certainly a number of the people who were speaking were professors or were students getting their PhDs in some aspect of te textile history or material culture. Um, but that was, that's not a requirement for attending the conference or being a member of the forum. So in the afternoon was really the majority of the, of the speakers. And the first one that they had was a woman who works at the Textile Research Center in Leiden, in the Netherlands. She did a slideshow that had a lot of the knitted items in their collection. So this is not a museum. It is a research center. And the whole idea is that you can go there and you can actually physically touch and look at these, these textiles. You can turn them inside out and see how they were made on the back. You can do all of that. And it includes things from, uh, from all different time periods, including one of the very oldest pieces of textiles uh, in existence is in their collection. So again, I'll leave a link down in the video description so you can take a look at their website. There were two speakers who were talking about knitting in the 1980s. One of them was a woman named Sandy Black, and I kept thinking her name sounded familiar to me, and then I thought, well, Sandy Black is not exactly an unusual name. It's probably just, I know, I've heard of somebody named Sandy Black before. So she is a professor of, I believe, fashion or fashion history um, at a university. But in the 1980s, in the, in the 70s and then into the 80s, she was a, a designer of hand knitting, hand knit items. And she had a group of hand knitters who knit her things and then they, they sold them. 
Uh, and it was really fun to see all of her designs from the 1980s because that was when I learned to knit was in 1980, early, early 1986. And so all of these things that she was showing just brought back those memories of the, that fashion and the knitting patterns that were available then. And so it was really fun to, to see that. Well, toward the end, she started talking about um, then leaving that, that world of of designing knitted items in the 1980s and then uh, becoming an, an academic uh, professor in different um, areas of knitting and fashion history. And then she showed a picture of this book right here, which is called Knitting Fashion Industry Craft, and it's by Sandy Black. So that was why I had heard of her before when I first became interested in uh, antique and vintage knitting patterns and was really looking into the history of machine knitting versus hand knitting uh, patterns and trying to understand um, the overlap. Um, I came across this book and I and I bought it. So so that was why her name sounded so familiar to me. And I'll, I'll leave a link down below um, to this book. The next presentation was a woman who grew up in the East side of Glasgow in a post-World War II housing development. And she's working on her PhD right now. And while she was doing her some research on home workers, she discovered, meaning that these were uh, people who would do knitting at home um, on behalf of someone else. So they would be uh, piecework, so they get paid by the piece. She discovered that her aunts and even her mother had worked for a while in the 1980s as home workers, but not in that way that, that was typically thought of where they were working uh, piecemeal uh, for somebody else. They, in fact, had their own home businesses where they were um, making what they wanted to make and selling it and getting all the profits for it. And it was over a short um, number of years while their children were small and at home. And then once the kids were off to school, then they put away their knitting machines and they got full-time work elsewhere. But it was really interesting to hear what she had discovered about members of her own family and then to be able to see the photographs of the items that her aunts and her mother had made. So a couple of years ago, when I, right when I was getting interested in antique uh, knitting manuals and antique knitting patterns, I discovered that an academic journal that's called Archaeological Textiles Reviews was publishing their annual issue. And so it was two years ago, it was in December of 2018. And the whole issue was devoted to, to knitting. And the idea was they were coming up with ways to describe knitting um, in very specific ways um, in, so that when somebody was reading an academic paper about knitting, there would be a common language. So this is something that's done in all other areas of archaeology. But knitting had been something that had really been ignored. And, and most articles were not very rigorously academic with their research and the language that was used could really vary and was pretty colloquial. So this was the issue where they defined all of these terms. So the issue, the Archaeological Textile Review comes out in December, but then a month later, you can always download the, the, a PDF of the, of the journal for free. So this particular issue is available for free and I will leave a link down below. One of the presentations in the Knitting History Forum was from a woman named Sylvie, who's from the Czech Republic, and she's going to have an article in this year's Archaeological Textiles Reviews. So I assume that that issue isn't going to be all about knitting, but it will be on a variety of things, but this particular article will be in there. And again, uh, about a month after the article, or after the journal is published, the PDF becomes available. So Sylvie was presenting the information that's going to be in this article, and it was about a, a two pair of gloves that were found in the graves of some abbesses. So none of the other uh, abbesses in that uh, graveyard had gloves uh, in their coffins, but these two women did. And so she was studying these gloves and trying to determine um, a particular feature about them that was very unusual. And that was that on the, the fingers of the index finger and the middle finger, there was a slit down each of the fingers. So they spent a long time studying those and trying to figure out what was going on. And they eventually they realized that 
at the time period when these gloves were knit, um, the way that rosary, be rosary beads were held was different than what is done today. And that, that those slits would have facilitated um, the abbesses being able to feel those beads in their hands as they went through the beads and uh, doing their prayers. So uh, that article again will be out in this year's Archaeological Textiles Reviews a journal in December and then I believe in January at some point um, a, a PDF of the journal will be available for download. So there was another presentation about gloves and it was two women who were getting started on a research project um, looking at liturgical gloves from all different places, as many places as they can find, and building a database of them. What they have found is there is no database. There's you know a few gloves here, a few gloves there, and descriptions of them. And so they are coming up with a systematic way when they get access to the gloves once uh, COVID's over and people can travel freely and do all of the study. They spent a lot of time thinking about what is the order uh, in which we're going to examine gloves? Because if we get two hours to examine 10 pair of gloves or something, you have to examine the right and the left hand and you have to do it in a very specific order and then take those photographs and be able to know when you're looking at a photograph, what am I looking at? Which finger or which glove am I looking at? So they were they were talking about the process that they, that they have developed for how they're going to examine um, these particular gloves. The final presentation was really interesting to me. It was a, a young woman from here in the United States who's working on her PhD, but she was presenting um, material that she had studied when she was working on her master's degree. She was researching this um, man who emigrated from Germany in the 1700s, and he brought with him two stocking frames. And at that time, it was illegal to import them, but he, he did it. And so he came here and he set up his business in Germantown, Pennsylvania, which is just north of, of uh, Philadelphia and is a well-known uh, textile hub in here in the United States. We had a, a, a yarn um, that every yarn company had that was called Germantown yarn. It was known that if yarn was spun in Germantown, that it was a really good high quality yarn. Prior to to that, um, this man came to the United States and had a stocking frame. And one of his stocking frames is still in existence and it's in a museum. Well, she went to look at it, but it's not, it doesn't operate anymore. It doesn't work. And she was having a really difficult time understanding how stocking frames actually work by reading the descriptions. And I've had that trouble too. I've been trying, to, I've tried to imagine how do they actually work? And the assumptions I made turned out to be wildly wrong. She ended up traveling to England and going to a museum there. I think it's the museum is the Frame Stocking Museum. I'll put some links down below. So she spent an afternoon there being trained on how to work the stocking frame and learning and being able to feel physically what it was like to sit in the chair and there were pedals that had to be operated and levers that had to be operated and it was it's a very noisy machine as well and she showed some video of of the stocking frame in operation and it was completely different from what I had imagined in my head so I'm going to leave some links down um, below to this museum because they have quite a few videos that talk about kind of the history of stocking frames But also you can see videos of how these actually work. It was really really interesting So I was so happy that I got to see uh, her presentation now all of these presentations that were from the knitting history forum Were recorded they were all done by zoom and I know that they were recorded. I don't know if they're going to be posting these uh, presentations anywhere and if they do where that is going to be. So when and if I find out where those videos are, I'll let you guys know um, in a future Casual Friday because some of you I think would be really interested in seeing uh, what the research that people are doing is or just what resources are available to people interested in textile history. So I asked you guys, I don't know, I think it was last week, about swatching. And for those of you who really hate swatching or who avoid swatching, it was kind of I was really interested in, in what your reasons were for that. So 
for some knitters, they're really new knitters and they're, they're slow and they feel like it takes so much effort just to get uh, some knitting done that the idea of having to do a huge swatch first um, is just kind of soul crushing. And I, I get that. There are people who said that they, they feel like it's a waste of yarn and they don't have any, they don't have room to store all of the swatches. And they, they, again, they want this to, they want it to be something. They don't want to just have a swatch that doesn't do anything other than it's a swatch. First of all, when you do a swatch, you don't have to keep the swatch. You can use that yarn again. You can use it in the project if you need it. Some people were worried about running out of yarn, like they wouldn't have enough yarn to complete their project because they would have used it in a swatch. So here's how uh, the yarn quantities work in a pattern. The designer is going to recommend a yarn, like usually the yarn that they use to produce the project. And they're going to recommend a certain number of balls of that yarn and which it adds up to a certain number of yards. That quantity of yarn includes enough yarn to do the swatching and is usually rounded up by 10%. So they look at how much yarn they uh, used for their project or that they estimate is, is required to do it and then they, they round it up by 10% to allow for swatching and allow for differences in knitting style. So, cause some people maybe will have more rows per inch and maybe they're gonna use more yarn or maybe they wanna knit, knit their sleeves an inch longer or something like that. So there's always additional built in into that estimate. And then they have to round up to the nearest whole ball. So if they're telling you six balls, that doesn't mean you actually need six full balls. You probably need five and a quarter or five and a half or something like that. But you can't buy, I have a ball of yarn, you have to buy six full balls of yarn. And so there's typically extra yarn built into the project. So you're not going to, like, you're not likely to run out of yarn for your project um, if you have done swatching. They're assuming you're going to do the swatching and they are including that amount in there. And secondly, if you are running out of yarn, you can use the yarn from the swatch. You can just rip it out and, and, and knit from it. Now, just because it's been washed doesn't mean that you can't use it. It will be kinky. And if you don't like the kinkiness, you can relax the yarn. I did a video on how to relax yarn that's super kinky that's been washed and blocked and I'll link to that up there. Some knitters only ever use recycled yarn to knit with. They'll go to thrift stores and they'll find hand knit sweaters and or they'll find commercially knit sweaters that they know aren't cut and sewn that so that when they rip it out, they can get full amounts of yarn and they might combine it might be really fine gauge yarn and they might combine several strands of it in order to create something that's a little thicker that they knit with or they might uh, dye it and then knit it into something else. But yarn can be re-knit and just because it's in the swatch doesn't mean you can't use it. Now, if you don't need it for your project, it's basically the same as having leftover yarn. So whatever you would do with your leftover yarn, you might keep it in a, a box of a bunch of leftovers. You could throw your swatch in there and that is available to be used if you need a little bit of some color at some point in a project um, where you don't want a whole ball of yarn, but you have a swatch there that has yarn in it that you could use. Or you might at some point in the future decide that you do want to swatch something because you're not sure you understand a particular stitch pattern and you want to make sure you understand how it works before you have to do 20 repeats in it of it in a particular uh, project. You want to just do one repeat so you can kind of understand how, you, how it works. You can use the yarn from that swatch in order to make that happen. It's never a waste of yarn. So I, I would just like to get that off the table. You might find that you don't want to spend your time on it, but it's not a waste of yarn because the yarn um, is always available um, to be used at any point um, currently or in the future. I got a comment uh, in the past, I think it was in the past week from somebody, and I don't even remember what video it was on, um, 
but the comment was, how do you keep your index finger from locking and cramping after all those knit stitches? And they were talking about me personally with my knitting style. And so I want to do an overhead to sh kind of talk about my knitting style and how it developed and what I'm doing. Because oftentimes when people are watching other knitters, they're seeing something specific that's different from how they do things. They, and they don't see a lot of the other things that are going into what they're doing that create that person's individual knitting style. So the comment about why doesn't your index, how do you keep your index finger from cramping, has to do with the fact that I keep my index finger kind of extended away from the knitting needle. There's more to my knitting style than just what my index finger is doing. So I wanna show you an overhead uh, about, and kind of talk you through my knitting style and how my knitting style developed and a little bit about what you can do to adapt your own knitting style if you would like to do that. So when I am knitting with the yarn in my left hand, which is called continental style, the way that I knit is that my index finger is quite a way away from the needle. And for some people who are watching me knit, that is what they're noticing is the distance between my needle and my finger. They're not observing other things. So let me just knit for a little bit and you can see what I'm doing. And see how many things that you can observe about how I knit. I'm going to switch to purling. So I've switched to purling. I'm going to switch back to knitting. I'm going to switch back to purling. I'm going to finish with a purl. And, and on this last one, I'm going to bring my finger down when I'm finishing it. If we look closer, you can see that I did do some knits and I did do some purls. You may have had trouble seeing me actually switch between knits and purls. So I'm gonna work another row. And this time, I'm, if a stitch presents as knits, I will knit it. If it presents as a purl, I will purl it. So if it looks like a knit, so if I see the smooth V underneath the needle, I'm going to knit it. But if I see that purl bump right underneath the needle, I'm going to purl it. So I'm knitting and you can see that the switch, it's going to switch to purl. I brought the yarn to the front. So I'm going to switch to knit. I'm going to scoop back a little bit again. So let's talk about what I'm doing. One comment I got one time on my knitting style was that it was an ergonomic disaster. Um, other people uh, have said that their method of knitting or purling is much easier. Uh, and uh, some people have asked, how do I keep my index finger from cramping? So when they're saying things like that, they're failing to notice all of the other things that I'm doing <laughs> when I'm knitting. So what they're talking about a lot of times is that some people knit with their uh, index finger very close uh, to the tip or very close to the needle. So it's, it's actually right up against the needle. And so they're doing what's called picking and, and I actually can't do it. Um, I don't have much practice with it. But anytime I have tried to do this style of knitting, within a few stitches, my, my finger pops up. And the reason is that, that my, the way that I hold the needles makes a difference and influences how I'm knitting. So here I am ready um, to knit. Now let's rotate my hand around and let's see what is going on underneath here. So you can see that the needle is anchored up against the edge of my palm. You can see that my pinky finger is the most curled and then the, the fingers become less curled as you go up the needle. And the other thing that you can see, let me put, put this in this hand so you can see without the, the, the knitting in the way. The edges of my fingers are touching the needles and that's kind of what's keeping it anchored right here. And that I have, 
full use of these fingers because these two are just keeping it anchored against here. I'm not holding my needles in my hands. I'm not wrapping my fingers around the needle, uh, around the needle. Some people do something that's more like this. And it's those people who are going to find that their index finger is naturally right up against the needle. And so if they, if I were to hold my, my needle like this, and then I tried to extend that finger, that would cramp after a while because, because of the way the muscles, uh, my fingers are wrapped around the needle, that would hurt. So, so it isn't about whether the, need, the finger is close to the needle or further away, it's about how are you holding the needles in general. That's going to influence your knitting style. The other thing about my knitting style that I didn't even notice uh, until a couple of years ago is that it is strongly influenced by my, my original knitting style, which was English method of knitting. I used very long needles. I used a 14 inch straight needle and I would anchor it against the junction of my hip and thigh. So this needle would not move. It was anchored there and I would touch it, um, but I managed the yarn with my right hand. Um, and because I wasn't really maneuvering the needle, I mean, I could angle it a little bit, what I was doing to, in order to knit a stitch was I was mounting the stitch on the left needle onto that right needle. So I'm going to anchor this up against my body a little bit just to kind of give it. So I would wrap the yarn around this and the stitches would come off. And so I was constantly um, bringing the left needle up I was constantly bringing the left needle on and off of the right needle. So this needle did not move very much. And the way I tensioned the yarn was um, kind of pinched in my uh, pinky finger here. I never was able to manage doing this in my right hand. So because I was used to this needle being stationary, when I started uh, knitting in Continental sometimes, I automatically kept this pretty still and mounted the stitches onto the right hand needle. So my knitting style comes from how I was holding the needles when I was knitting English. Um, but that was also where I was holding the needle like this. I wasn't holding the needle like that. I was um, doing this so that I could push the stitches along and, and work them accordingly. So I was, I've always held my needle like this, and I've always mounted my uh, the left needle onto the right needle. And that's really necessary when you have one of these kind of anchored styles of knitting is that you're not m moving this around. So you always have a choice. You always have a choice whether you are manipulating your knitting using your right hand needle. Are you entering, you, are you manipulating with your right hand needle or are you manipulating with your left hand needle? What is controlling how those stitches are being made? Then you also have, how are you holding the needles? How are you tensioning the yarn? Uh, all of those things combined create a knitting style. So if you are trying to adjust your knitting style, maybe to be more efficient, you need to kind of pay attention when you are trying to copy somebody else's knitting style about what else it is that they're doing with their hands. If they're holding their needles in a very different way than you hold them, that knitting style may not work well for you unless you are able to overcome that muscle memory. So my feeling is that you work with what's comfortable and then you make observations about what needs to change. So uh, for a long time, I was able to do a knit stitch and you'll notice that because my finger is pretty far away that I have a hard time um, just grabbing the, the stitch and, and, let, and pulling it through. So I naturally bring my finger up to anchor that yarn against the needle as I'm completing a stitch. When I purl, if a stitch comes off the needle, I just make a little bit of a movement like this and I'm in position to purl and and as I come to grab the yarn again, I'm anchoring it and then I'm rotating a little bit to uh, complete that stitch. So I'll give you a further away demonstration so you can see 
what my hands are doing as I'm switching from pearl to pearl. So one of the things that can help you if you are struggling with being slow or inefficient is to watch what your hands are doing as you're knitting. And are you, are you doing something that isn't necessary? So for example, are you finishing your stitch and then stopping to tighten things up or tap your finger on the needle? Or are you excessively moving your needles around? If you keep them perpendicular like this, you're going to get more even stitches, but it's just going to be more um, efficient way of doing it than to try to, to maneuver your needles around in different ways as you're knitting. And also, if you end up further from the needles as well, that means that you have a long way to get it off the needle, and you're going to end up uh, distorting the stitches and pulling them off. So if you can work near the tip, where the, just where the taper um, is, um, you can work on the taper, on the left-hand needle, but you want to finish the stitch on the actual full shaft on the right-hand needle so that the stitch is the full size um, than it needs to be and it will slide along the needle easily. So just watch your position of your needles. Watch what your fingers are doing and if there's anything that they're doing that is absolutely not necessary. And then when you are observing other knitters who seem to be very efficient, look at how they're holding the needles to see if they're doing something very different from what you're doing. Um, and if you can even adapt your knitting style to what they're doing, it could be just not possible based on the way that you hold the needles. I've been buying yarns from all over the place lately that have different construction than the kinds of yarns I typically knit with. I typically knit with very basic solid color worsted weight yarns, nothing remarkable about them. Every yarn company has a yarn that's nearly identical to that. And so I've been wanting to explore other yarns. Part of the reason I have to go out and look for them is because they aren't just the typical yarns. There is something different about them. And so, so some of these yarns that I've been buying are coming from smaller mills. And in particular, the yarns that have what are what's called Z-ply to them tend to come from smaller mills. And that's one of the things, I, one of the questions I'm trying to answer is why that is. I don't know that there is a specific reason why, why that is other than it makes their yarns different from all of the sort of generic yarns that are produced by the big mills. So that's, that's one of the things I've been trying to explore now. So what I want to show you are the experiments that I've been doing with two yarns that are both wool and spun produced on antique mule spinners. And one of them has an S ply and one of them has a Z ply. And so I'm going to show you the before and after of each of the swatches as well as how they work in color work and cables and how that compares um, to a worsted spun yarn uh, when, when done in cables versus color work. I want to share these swatches that I've been knitting with these yarns that I got from mills that use what is called a mule spinner or a spinning mule. They produce woolen spun yarns. They're using antique machines um, to produce woolen spun yarns. So you can see what this fabric looks like when it's just first off the needles. Now look at what it looks like after it's been washed and look how soft it is and how fuzzy and how much any gaps between the stitches have been filled in. So uh, this is what a woolen spun yarn looks like. And let's look at the, at the before and after of the yarn tails. So the one on the right is uh, before it's been washed and the one on the left is after it's been washed. And you see how much it kind of blooms up and, and that's what causes all of those spaces to, to fill in. But you'll also notice that you can see the stitches, but it's not, they're not clear stitches the way you would see 
in what is called a worsted spun yarn. This is a swatch that uses uh, a regular commercial, This I think this is Plymouth Galway, and so this is a worsted spun yarn. The swatch has been washed and blocked, and the stitches look pretty much the same as they um, before and after uh, you knit. Things will smooth out a little bit from washing and blocking, but you, you don't lose that stitch dish definition. You can see every single stitch. It's very easy to count stitches if you need to. Where if you look at this, um, it's, a, it's, it's a little harder, especially counting rows I found to be um, kind of a challenge. I had to resort to counting the ridges of the garter stitch. Here I did a swatch with color work so a lot of uh, knitters like to use woolen spun yarns for their stranded color work because it's a stickier yarn, so it's nice for stranded color work if you're doing steaking. But also because, because those, you lose some stitch definition, those colors kind of blend together. You don't see every single stitch um, exactly defined on its own the way you do when uh, you are using a worsted spun yarn. So that doesn't mean that it's bad to use worsted spun yarns for color work and uh, that you should only use woolen spun uh, for color work. It just means that you get different effects from the two of them. So you, you can know what to expect if you're using a woolen spun yarn versus a worsted spun yarn. This is another example of a woolen spun yarn, again, um, made on a mule spinner. This yarn has a Z twist where the first yarn had an S twist. If you look at this yarn, you can see that the, the twist angles up to the right, just like the center of the letter Z. While wow, this yarn has, this is a little bit hairier yarn, so it's a little harder to see, but you can see that the twist goes up to the left. So this is an S plied yarn. So, and the, there is another difference too. This purple one is merino, and this other one is some other uh, wool that's not specified. Both of these are come from American uh, sheep sheep farms, um, but other than that, um, they're very different breeds. So again, you can see the difference um, from before the wool was washed on the left and after it was washed on the right. It just plumps up and it fills in those spaces. So here is, here's the, um, the swatch when it was just off the needles and it hasn't been uh, washed or blocked. And then here it is after it's been washed and it, and it just, those stitches just soften and blend into each other. So it creates a very different fabric than a worsted spun yarn. The yarn that was used for this color work right here, I used to knit a little swatch of cables. This, this has been washed and blocked. This is the worsted spun yarn before it was washed and this is it after it's washed. So it doesn't really have any difference in appearance. And when you look at these cables, you can see every single stitch. This is what's meant by stitch de definition. You can see every single stitch in these cables. Here I did those same cables um, and I used the woolen spun yarn to do it. So you can see there's a lot of um, depth to this fabric. This is, happens a lot in cables. You'll see a lot of, of depth to the stitches before um, they've been washed and blocked. But then here are these same cables after they've been washed and blocked. So they, they've softened. You don't see the actual uh, individual stitches as much anymore. Um, and there's still plenty of depth to them, but not quite uh, the same as what you see. And again, this is true for uh, most cable fabrics. So this just produces um, softer cables. There's still plenty of definition there, but it's just, they're just softer. The difference between a woolen yarn and a worsted yarn, and I'm not talking about worsted weight, I'm talking about how the yarn is spun, has to do with how the wool is prepared before it's spun and then how it is actually spun. So there are two basic ways of preparing the wool. One is carding it and the other is combing it. So carding 
separates the fibers from the original uh, locks uh, that you come off of the sheep, it separates them out, but it separates them out in all different directions. It doesn't try to align them at all. And, and the way that you do that is you can either, in hand spinning, you can use a set of hand cards that look like dog brushes, or you can use something called a drum carter that's a cylinder with this carding cloth on it with spikes. Um, commercial mills will use a huge version of that drum carter in order to card fiber. And in a commercial mill, all fiber is carded first. So this is combed top. And so combing would be done with actual combs. Um, and it, the purpose is to line all the fibers so that they're all parallel and lined up next to each other. Um, so that is a worsted preparation. So the woolen preparation is carding and the worsted preparation is combing. In a commercial mill, the, the wool is carded first and then it goes through a series of pin combs in order to uh, straighten out all of, and, and, and align all of those fibers. In hand spinning, you either card or you comb. Uh, you, you wouldn't card and then comb, although you could. If you, would, if you had some carded fiber that you wanted to comb, you could do that later. The next step is how the yarn is spun. So a worsted preparation starts with these fibers that are all in parallel. In order to turn it into yarn, it has to twist. The fibers are twisted together in order to turn it into a yarn. Well, in a worsted preparation, the spinning is done, the, the hand spinner holds the fibers locked right here. And so all of the spinning is done um, without entering what's called the drafting zone, which is it's behind that pinched point. So the spinning wheel is spinning these fibers and creating the twist. And the hand spinner is holding those fibers. And then they're taking this set of fibers and they're drafting it out. They're pulling these uh, longer until they get the amount that they want. And then they slide their thumb, uh, they slide their, their thumb down um, to this point right here. And then the spinning wheel is, is, is adding more twist. So with worsted spinning, you are drafting and then you're allowing the twist to enter the fibers. And in the whole time, it's keeping those fibers parallel to each other. And it creates a very smooth yarn, but also a denser yarn. When you spin woolen, the process is different. Um, and that is, you have the spinning wheel is adding twist. And as it, your hand is further back and as it's adding twist, you are pulling back on those fibers. So the twist is entering the fibers while you are drafting them. And that process is, is called spinning woolen. So I have some more yarn that is on my way from Canada. And this time it's from a mill called Belfast Mini Mills on Prince Edward Island in Canada. So, you know, I've been on this constant search for Z-plied yarn. And this particular yarn is Z-plied and it's called uh, semi-worsted is the, the preparation of the wool. So it's not worsted and it's not woolen. It's somewhere in between. And that I knew is possible for hand spinning. And I wondered what that meant though for their particular mill. So I sent them an email. I've been writing to these mills <laughs> in the past few months, asking questions and I never get a response back. But I, I thought, well, I'm gonna ask them anyway. Why did you guys decide to z-ply your yarn? And secondly, what do you mean by semi-worsted? So the next morning I got a, an email back from Troy who is the mill manager at Belfast Mini Mills. So Belfast Mini Mills actually manufactures equipment for people who want to operate what are called mini mills. So they're doing small batches of yarn. So if, if a shepherd has a flock of sheep and they have uh, sheared all their sheep and they want to produce yarn from their flock, a lot of the big mills have minimum quantities that you can run through, but these mini mills can handle smaller quantities. Belfast Mini Mills produces this equipment, but they also have an operating mill on their site so that when people are buying their equipment, they can come there and learn how to use it and, and see 
you know, how it works and, and, um, and learn the whole process. So they produce their own yarn as well. And they chose to, to do it as a Z plied yarn. Well, it turns out that they started a podcast this past May. And so I was looking at their podcast and one of the very first uh, episodes, they spent about half an hour talking about their equipment and showing what's going on at different points in the process. And one of the three people who is in the voiceover, there's Troy, the mill manager, and then a woman who works, um, who works in the mill and does a lot of the knitting there. And she's a well, all around fiber artist. And then the third person was one of the sons of the owners. And at some point in the video, he said, yeah, mom's a rebel. And so she decided to make it Z plied. So that's just an indication to me is like, well, all the big commercial mills are doing S plied. I'm just going to do something different. And it's a way to make a small mill, a small producer have something more unique about their yarn. And not just the beautiful colors or the interesting fiber combinations, but they can just create a unique yarn that you're not going to be able to get anywhere else. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, and I'm so happy that he actually uh, emailed me back and was able to answer some questions. So I'll, I'm looking forward to getting that yarn in some probably it's probably going to take a couple of weeks because it's got to come across the border. And last time I got something from Canada, it took a couple of weeks. So I'm looking forward to working with that yarn and then comparing it to the other Z plied yarns, um, the woolen ones, as well as um, if I can find some that are true worsted that are Z plied. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to compare all of those and, and, and see what I think. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.